True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The car slides to a stop against the barrier, but the man inside doesn't stir. He's out cold, and as the car is doused in petrol and set alight, his breathing will slow as his lungs gradually fill with smoke. Outside, another man screams for help from passers-by. It's his friend. His friend is stuck in the burning car. But all is not what it seems. And soon, the truth will unravel. But for the man in the car, it might be too late. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht. And you're listening to episode 81, The Murder of Johannes Doe. This week's episode most certainly covers some twisted individuals. And in the same vein, this week's true crime TV must-watch is the premiere of Twisted Killers Season 1, starting on Monday the 6th of June on CBS Justice, telling the shocking stories of some of America's darkest murders. Along the way, a trio of criminal experts, including former LAPD homicide detective Tracy Benjamin and forensic psychologist Kate Termini, provide insights and expertise on how the killers were brought to justice. Watch a new episode every weeknight from Monday the 6th until Friday the 17th of June on DSTV Channel 170 at 7pm. A huge thank you to CBS Justice for sponsoring this episode of True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Joshua Miller, Lynette Proudfoot, Melanie van Arder, Jane Swanepoel, Cizwer Molusi, Shante, Elna Badenhorst, Amy Ward, Francois Stein, Leandri van Niekerk, Renal Kukumur, Naomi Britz, and Laura Dove for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. In addition to the shout-out and monthly exclusive episode that Patreons get, I also now upload an ad-free version of every week's episode to Patreon. So if you prefer not to hear the ads, and sign up for a minimum monthly contribution of just $1, which at the moment is about 16 rand. It's a pretty good deal. If you like discounts, because who doesn't, head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, print crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for 10% discounts and support the show at the same time. And you can also get 10% off when you order from Wallpaper Online by using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use. Today's case is pulled from the archives of Safley. You have very likely never heard about it, and I hadn't either. Every now and then when I'm searching for judgments on cases, I'll stumble onto documents like this that catch my eye. And this case reminded me so much of the Zach Valentine debacle, especially in its targeting of society's most vulnerable, that I absolutely had to share it with you. My research for this case came from several legal documents I found online. So let's get into episode 81, The Murder of Johannes Doe. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. 
Dean Lloyd Plank was born in 1968. He was considered to be a highly intelligent young man and did very well in school. Unfortunately, his social skills and ability to maintain relationships was rather poor, and by the time he was 20, he'd already broken ties with his entire family after several altercations with his parents, sisters and brothers, and he was living on his own. After school, he trained as a paramedic and had become engaged to a woman named Claire Gillespie. Dean and Claire's relationship didn't work out, though, and although their engagements ended, they did stay in contact. It's likely that Dean's erratic and impulsive behaviour had contributed to the breakup. He was regularly in trouble at work for simply not showing up without any explanation, and he'd managed to build up a significant amount of debt, which swallowed up almost his entire monthly salary in repayments. These issues, though, seemed minuscule in Dean's mind compared to what was looming on the horizon. When Dean turned 21 on the 1st of February 1989, he was due to report for his compulsory conscription in the army. When South Africa was still under apartheid rule, there was a compulsory period of army enrolment that all white males from the age of 18 had to undertake. Essentially, as soon as a boy matriculated, or if he'd left school early as soon as he turned 18, he would be required to enrol in the South African Defence Force, or SADF. Now, this wasn't really something you could dodge, and unless you had a major disability, there was no way you were getting out of this. People tried. Many young men actually fled the country to avoid their conscription. I know people who spent time in jail because their religion prevented them from participating in war, and the South African governments didn't recognise this as a valid reason. The SA government had gradually increased the mandatory conscription period until all men were required to devote at least two years of their life to the SADF. One way you could delay your conscription was by signing up to study a vocation that would be needed in time of war, like being a paramedic, for instance, which is exactly what Dean had done. But he'd completed his studies, and now the clock was counting down to his 21st birthday, on which he would have to report to begin serving. Dean did not want to do this, and it was a topic he discussed with his friend Gert Swart on many occasions. Gert Swart was born in 1960. At 29 years old, he was already in his second marriage. He had a daughter from his first marriage and another child with his second wife. He too was employed as a paramedic, and it was at work that he'd met the young and impulsive Dean Plank. By all accounts, Swart was not a highly intelligent man. He was able to cope with day-to-day activities and plan, but he often struggled with high-level thinking and was apparently quite easily manipulated in his gullibility. Swart had served his own conscription period without much fanfare, so when his young friend began to talk about his desperate need to avoid this and began mentioning some crazy plans he had, The older man didn't take it too seriously. He was sure Dean was just nervous about his conscription, and he would surely settle in and get over his anxiety. Dean Plank, though, had a very specific plan in mind, and it wouldn't just help him to avoid conscription. It would actually set him up financially, almost for life, and give him the opportunity to start a completely new life. He knew, though, that he couldn't pull off the idea on his own, so he started to run the idea past his friend, and found a way to make the plan appealing to Kurt as well. Dean Plank had decided that he was going to fake his own death. Plank knew that he wanted to not only be able to start a new life, and of course avoid his conscription, but 
but he wanted to be able to do so on a far better financial footing. So in his mind, the ideal would be if he could take out some life insurance policies and then after faking his death, cash in on them. To do this, he needed a partner in crime though. Someone who he knew could use a cut of the money and who he could trust to not rat him out. Dean decided that this person was Gert. When Dean first put the idea of him faking his death out there, Gert's ward claims he thought it was a joke. In fact, both men would claim this without fail in varying degrees. Gert would allege that they'd often dreamed up weird schemes like this and fantasized about how they could get rich quick in many different ways. Dean, at least, was very serious about his plan from day one, though. The first idea he ran past Gert was that he thought perhaps he could drive his car over a cliff and that then the police would just assume his body had been lost at sea. Gert soon cut in and said that this would not work because he had a friend in insurance and he knew that they didn't pay out if there was no body. Okay, back to the drawing board. But what's that? You say you have a friend in the insurance industry? Well, that's a pretty good starting point. We can always iron out the details later. On the 2nd of January 1989, Gert Swart called his friend in the insurance industry who worked for Old Mutual and told him he was sending a customer his way. Gert's friends sold insurance policies, so he was grateful to get the business, which would earn him a commission. He, of course, was not told that the policies were part of a bigger criminal scheme. Gert told the man that Dean Plank would be making Gert the beneficiary on the policies he took out that day. Dean took out two policies with Old Mutual. The cumulative value was 500,000 rand. On the 5th of January, Dean went to Sunlam and took out another policy to ensure his life. This one was valued at 300,000 rand. The combined premiums to be paid for these policies was 250 rand per month. It's important to note that although there were waiting periods on these policies for certain types of deaths, such as death by illness or suicide, the benefit for accidental death kicked in immediately, and Dean made very sure of that with each of the consultants he dealt with. Then, five days later, on the 10th of January, Dean made an appointment with an attorney and drew up a will. In it, he left his car and 50,000 rand to his parents. The latter money was to pay off a debt he had to them, and he bequeathed the remainder of his estate to his good friend, Gert Swart. In conversation with the insurance consultants and the lawyer, Dean said that he was afraid that he would be killed while serving in the South African Defence Force, and this was why he was getting his affairs in order before he left. After leaving the lawyer's office, Dean visited his ex fiance Claire Gillespie. He relayed the following plan to her. He decided that they were going to steal a body from the mortuary and put it in his car. He would choose a body that was similar in size and age to him and ensure that the body was burned beyond recognition. He was going to be getting an ID in the name Wayne Woodland. And after he'd staged the accident, his friend Gert Swart would claim that it was Dean in the car. His life insurance policies would pay out to Gert, and Gert would then ensure that Dean got his cut. Gillespie would later say that it was not uncommon for Dean to come up with these half-baked ideas. In fact, she said, it was one of the reasons she decided to break up with him, as she felt he just lived in a dream world. So when he told her the story, she smiled and nodded and thought nothing much more of it. After this conversation with Claire, Dean floated the idea to Gert 
that they could steal a body from the mortuary. Gert, though, told Dean that this would not work, because as soon as they did the autopsy, they would figure out that the person had been dead before the car accidents had occurred. One of the things that got to me about this plan was that both men didn't seem to think that actually stealing a body was a hurdle. In fact, they both seemed quite certain that they would be able to quite easily remove an entire dead body from what should be a pretty secure facility. Now, considering both these men worked as paramedics, it is entirely possible that they had connections at the mortuary, which they'd intended to use for this purpose. So perhaps that is why. For them, it didn't really seem like an obstacle. In fact, the connections that these men had would actually become quite important in this case, and it just goes to show that corruption in state departments is nothing new, despite us perhaps now seeing it at unprecedented levels. On the 12th of January, Dean Plank carried out the next part of his plan. He arrived at his local police station and told the officer on duty that his name was Wayne Woodlin, and he'd lost his ID and needed an affidavit to apply for a new one. The officer duly allowed Dean to fill out a form and stamped it for him. The failsafe here would be that Home Affairs should be able to check that the ID he was applying for in fact belonged to him. Of course, this was also 1989, so identity fraud was nowhere near as prevalent as it is today, and there wouldn't have been as many checks and balances in place. Dean, though, had a secret weapon. Gert Swart's first wife worked for home affairs. Now, we don't really know how much this woman knew about what was going on, but she did take Dean's forms from him signed them off as though they'd been checked and cleared by a home affairs representative, and pushed them through for priority clearance. Within days, Dean Plank had a new ID book, under the name Wayne Woodlin. Everything seemed to be falling into place. The only problem now was, who was going to play the role of Dean Plank in this creation of the death of Dean Plank? After much discussion, Gert would say that it was Dean who had first suggested that they could find a homeless person, drug him with tranquilizers they could steal from work, and put him in Dean's car. The idea of murder had just been raised. At one point during this planning phase, an interesting event occurred, which, depending on how you look at it, could have meant a few different things. It would later emerge that Gert had suggested that they needed to practice their plan to ensure it went off without a hitch. He told Dean that he should play the role of the homeless person they planned to kill in this rehearsal. Dean agreed, and in the middle of the night, the men drove to an isolated spot, and Gert bound Dean's hands and feet the way they planned to do with their victim. When Dean was completely helpless, Gert pulled out a syringe and some fluid and told Dean that he was going to kill him so that he didn't have to split the money. He started to approach Dean with the syringe, which he believed contained a tranquilizer. Dean understandably freaked out and started moving around in an attempt to dodge the syringe. Then, as suddenly as the terrifying experience had begun, Gert suddenly put down the syringe and untied Dean claiming that he'd only been kidding. Gert would later say that he'd actually wanted Dean to understand how another person might feel in the same situation in an effort to dissuade him from going through with his plan. And maybe there's a grain of truth to that. Or maybe it was just a sick joke. But the third maybe is perhaps Gert Swartz had really considered making sure that Dean really died so that he could have all that money. Despite Kurt later saying that he'd thought this idea to be a fantasy and not something that they were actually going to do, he certainly did a lot of the legwork along with Dean for this so-called fantasy. 
On the 26th of January, both men went to the offices of Old Mutual and Sunlam to get copies of their insurance documents. On the 30th of January, Dean Plank visited a hairdresser where he'd had his hair dyed from light brown to blonde. This was clearly going to be as part of his ruse to change his identity. It's important to keep in mind that the 1st of February was Dean's 21st birthday and the day that he was required to report for his conscription duties in the army. If he did not arrive, a warrant for his arrest would immediately be issued, and he could not risk police looking for him too intently, so he had to ensure that his plan was carried out before then. On the evening of the 31st of January, Dean picked up Gert, and they drove to the railway station. Gert stayed inside the car, and Dean went into the building. There he found a man sleeping on a bench. He asked the man if he had a place to sleep for the night, and he said he was staying at a shelter close by, but they only opened later, and he had to wait until then. Dean told the man that he could come with him, and he would let him drive around with him and his friend, and then they'd drop him off at the shelter later. I keep referring to this person as the man, because sadly, that's all we know about him. He was never identified, and although his age range would later be determined as being in his 40s, other than that, all we know that he was down on his luck at that particular time. He was a man, and he was approximately in his 40s. Now if you're wondering about the episode title, and how I came to that name, well, it's my own little play on the overseas term for an unidentified male, John Doe. I just South Africanized it a little and decided on Johannes Doe. Really, I would prefer to be able to actually name the victim in this case, but that's not possible. So at least we can refer to him as something a bit more humanizing than the man. Johannes Doe agreed to accompany Dean, who was a young man, by all accounts pretty charming, and who was also used to dealing with patients as a paramedic on a daily basis, so he would have known exactly how to talk to this man, to get him to do what he wanted. Johannes Doe got into the back of Dean's car, and the two men in the front handed back a bottle of brandy. They told Johannes to drink as much as he liked. The man took a sip, but Gert and Dean encouraged him to drink more, and then even more. They drove around for about half an hour, and soon Johannes Doe was passed out cold in the back seat. Then Gert and Dean drove to a hotel whose bar they liked to drink at. Now, I'd considered that they may have actually needed a little Dutch courage of their own for the deed they were about to commit but I actually think that this watering hole stop played a double purpose. They were about to stage an accident, and perhaps they wanted to be able to say that their intoxication contributed to the accident. If this is the case, they may not have thought this through too well, because there was every chance that the insurance company might see this intoxication as a reason not to pay out. But as it would unfold... That would be neither here nor there. With their throats well lubricated, Dean and Gert got into Dean's car. Johannes Doe was still fast asleep in the back seat, and they drove to an isolated area where they both got out, pulled the sleeping man out of the back, and lay him in the front passenger seat. They were going to claim that Gert had been driving because Dean had been passed out in the passenger seat so they reclined the seat so that Johannes Doe was laying as far back as possible and then strapped him into the seat with the seat belt. Then Dean got into the driver's seat and Gert got into the back. As they drove, Gert began to get cold feet. This was all becoming very real, and now that they actually had a human being in the car, he suddenly wasn't entirely sure he wanted to go through with the plan. Dean silenced his concerns. Think about the money. You'll have enough money 
to take care of your children for a very long time. The pair had carefully selected the area where the staged accident would occur. It was a stretch of road with a railing into which they could smash the car to simulate an accident. It also had very little traffic, but there were occasional passers-by, so Kat wouldn't have to wait too long for someone to spot him. But it would be long enough for the car and the unsuspecting innocent passenger to be burned out beyond recognition. Kat got out of the vehicle and waited on the side of the road while Dean accelerated and smashed the car into the railings. Johannes Doe continued to sleep. Then Dean got out of the car and removed two bottles of petrol from the boot. He began to spread the petrol around inside the vehicle, across the body of the sleeping man, and then across the exterior of the vehicle for good measure. Kat sat with his head in his hands on the side of the road. Then Dean lit a match, and the vehicle erupted into flames. Without a word to Kat, Dean ran into the bushes on the side of the road which would shield him from passers-by and carried on running until the bright light of the fire and the smell of burning was far enough away that he could not be linked with it. Then he slowed down to a walk. Dean would walk 15 kilometres to Khat's flat. We don't know what he did there, but presumably something had been left behind which would aid him in his escape. We also don't know whether Khat's wife and child were aware of Dean's presence there. After he left the flat, he travelled to Germiston Station, where he made a call to Claire Gillespie. He told her that he'd carried out his plan and he needed her to fetch him and drive him to Durban. Claire, woken from deep sleep by her ex fiance's phone call, couldn't believe what she was hearing. She'd been sure that he'd just been spouting another one of his wild fantasies, but now it seemed he actually had been very serious. Claire was horrified and refused to involve herself in his plans any further. She said that there was no way she was picking him up and taking him anywhere. With his charm having failed him and his ex refusing to assist, Dean had to make another plan. We don't know exactly how Dean Plank, a.k.a. Wayne Woodland, managed to make it to Durban, but he did, and he booked into a hotel there later that day under his new alias. Back at the scene of the crash, Khat had briefly considered running away and ending all involvement in the ruse. But just as he was about to, a car passed, and seeing the flames, slowed and pulled over. Now Khat had no choice but to continue with the plan. By the time the first people pulled over at the scene, the fire was so engaged that there was no saving the man inside without risking significant bodily harm themselves. Khat told the people that it was his friend that was stuck inside. He said they'd been on their way back from the bar and had lost their way and tried to make a U-turn, but Khat had accidentally pulled into the path of an oncoming taxi which had T-boned them, causing their car to spin and lose control before coming to rest against the railings and bursting into flames. He said that he had only just managed to escape through the windscreen in time, but hadn't been able to save his friend. He gave another car that stopped the number for the ambulance service he worked for and his brother's number. An ambulance arrived shortly afterwards, followed by a fire truck, which put out the blaze. Khat was transported to the hospital, but was found not to have sustained any injuries. When he was asked for the name of the person in the vehicle, he gave the name Dean Plank. After being assessed at the hospital, Khat was taken to the police station where he gave a statement explaining what had happened, or at least the version he'd given the first person that stopped, and he confirmed once again that the person that had burned to death in the vehicle was his friend, Dean Plank. He was then given a lift home to his flat. Later that afternoon, he was paid a visit by Dean Plank's brother-in-law, Clive Brummer. 
It would later emerge that when Claire Gillespie had received that phone call from Dean Plank in the middle of the night, she hadn't known what to do. Her gut told her that she needed to tell someone what Dean had done, but she still wasn't certain whether he was even telling the truth about the plot. In addition, she didn't know at this stage that there'd been a living person inside the vehicle. She was still under the impression that Dean had used a corpse, a corpse he'd stolen from the mortuary. When he'd called her, all he'd said about the deed was, it is done, and then proceeded to tell her to come and collect him. She still had no idea that it had involved murder, although certainly theft and desecration of a corpse would have been bad enough in my mind. Her fears that Dean was being serious were confirmed when, as dawn broke, she received a telephone call from Dean's brother telling her that Dean had died in a car accident the night before. Claire had received the news and put the phone down without saying anything about what she knew. She needed to think first. Later that day, Claire drove to Dean's brother's house. His brother wasn't there, but she spoke with his wife and told her what she knew. It was at this point that Clive Brummer, Dean's brother-in-law, was called and informed of what was happening. He decided to go to Gert's flat and see what the man had to say, before he took all of this to the police. When Gert Swart opened the door to his flat that afternoon, he didn't look at all surprised to see Clive Brummer standing there. He greeted the man gave him condolences, and invited him inside. When Clive asked what had happened, he relayed a similar story he'd given the first people that stopped at the scene and to the police. Except now, he said that Dean hadn't been driving because his arm was injured, and that he, Gert, had not escaped through the windscreen, but had actually been flung through it and knocked unconscious on the road. When he'd come to, the car was already engulfed in flames. And it is these little changes, additions and embellishments to a story, that trip up most people when they try to lie. Certainly after such a traumatic incident, it is entirely possible for memory to return and for someone to be able to add more to a story than they were initially able to. But what Chad was doing was changing the basic facts of the situation. Escaping through a windshield is very different from being flung out of one, and he had to have been the luckiest guy in history, because he hadn't sustained a single injury while being flung through a sheet of glass and then being knocked unconscious on the tar road. Clive Brummer, to his credit, didn't bat an eyelid. He simply listened to what the man had to say. Then Gert went into his bedroom and brought out some documents. To Brummer's surprise, Gert was in possession of his brother-in-law Dean's life insurance policy documents and a copy of his final will and testament. The man showed Brummer the documents and explained that the estate would pay 50,000 rand to Dean's parents, but sadly the vehicle he'd also left to them had been completely destroyed in the accident. Clive thanked Gert and left the flat. He headed straight to the police station. Shortly afterwards, Gert made two phone calls. One was to his friend at Old Mutual, and he shared the sad news that his friend Dean had passed away and asked what he would need in order to claim. Then he phoned the lawyers that held the copy of Dean's will, and who would act as executors and inform them of his passing. In the early hours of the 2nd of February 1989, police knocked on the door to Gert Swart's flat. They informed him that he was under arrest for murder and took him into custody. With all of the testimony from Claire Gillespie, who had since given a full statement to police, all investigators had had to do was follow the trail she gave them, and along the way, they found proof of everything she'd said Dean told her. They found his affidavit at the police station, and after questioning Gert's ex-wife, 
She admitted that she'd helped him get the ID application pushed through. When Kat was questioned, he admitted what had happened, but still claimed that he'd thought it was all a joke until there had actually been a person in the car and Dean had set him and the car alight. He said that after that, he felt he had no choice but to go along with the rest of the plan to avoid getting into trouble. He insisted that everything had been Dean's idea and offered to tell them where he was hiding out. Investigators loaded Gert into a car and immediately set out for Durban. When they got there, he directed them to the hotel that he and Dean had discussed he would book into. The receptionist was able to confirm on the officer's inquiry that a Wayne Woodland was indeed booked into the hotel. She gave him the room number too. When detectives knocked on the door to the room they'd been shown to, the man that opened the door identified himself as Wayne Woodland. The officers asked if he knew Hart, and the man said he didn't. The officers said that if they hadn't known for a fact that it was Dean Plank standing in front of them, they may well have been convinced that they were wrong, because Dean was that convincing. Eventually, after much conversation and the police informing Dean that all they would actually need to do was take his fingerprints to prove who he was, Dean caved and admitted his true identity. According to the police officers, his actual words were, quote, Okay, you've got me. I'm Dean Plank, and we killed a hobo. End quote. Dean would deny he'd ever said these words, despite two policemen and Gert Swart stating that he had. Plank was arrested and transported back to Johannesburg to stand trial with his co-accused, Gert Swart. Both men were charged with the murder of the still unnamed man, as well as fraud for the fake ID documents and their attempts to illegally claim life insurance money. During the trial, both men held fast to their claims that the death had not been intentional. Dean claimed while he had poured petrol into the car, he'd actually changed his mind at that point and walked to her to ask him to help get the man out the car, but while he'd been walking away, he thinks the man woke up and tried to light a cigarette, which had caused the car to erupt in flames. What would become very clear is that the two men understood that the death penalty was on the table for their crime. This was 1989, and South Africa was still actively carrying out executions and handing down death sentences. With these stories, all they were trying to do was provide any form of mitigation which may spare their own lives. The irony of the man who'd attempted to fake his own death and so callously taken the life of another in the process, now desperate to save his own life, was certainly not lost on those that attended the trial. For Gert's part, many believed that he was a simple man led astray by a manipulative and crafty character in Plank, but the judge would not see it that way. He found both men guilty of the charges against them, and when mitigating and aggravating circumstances were discussed, he refused to accept either Dean's youth as, as a mitigating factor, nor the idea that Gert was led by Dean. In the judge's mind, Gert had played a pivotal role in the crime by arranging the largest of the insurance policies. He had also provided Dean with all the reasoning as to why he shouldn't use his other plans of the car going over the cliff and stealing a dead body. He had shown clear deliberation and planning and could have walked away from the crime at any time, the judge said, but he hadn't. As for Dean... He had already been living on his own for a long time and had shown maturity beyond his years. The crime had been driven, the judge said, by pure greed and the desire to dodge military duty. As a result, he sentenced both men to death. Now, in 1989, 
the winds of change were already starting to blow in South Africa. And although executions were still happening, they were nowhere near as frequent or as quick as they once had been. This would provide Plank and Swart with an opportunity to appeal their sentences in 1991. This appeal would be denied, however, and their death sentences remained. But in that same year, the South African government announced that the death penalty would be put on ice for the time being, and no executions would be carried out until the country could decide whether the penalty would remain in place. Then, shortly after that announcement, the death penalty was officially abolished in South Africa. All offenders on death row had their sentences commuted to life. But this was before the minimum sentences legislation was in place. So instead of the life sentence we now know of 25 years minimum direct imprisonment, so-called lifers at that time only had to serve half of those 25 years before they'd become eligible for parole. So despite the gallows having hung over the heads of some of these men, some ex-death row offenders would actually be released after having served 12 and a half years of their sentences. The very thought of that is terrifying. You have to do some pretty heinous stuff to be sentenced to death. And there was clearly a serious ball dropped here that allowed this loophole to be accessed by such dangerous offenders. What would go on to happen, though, is that, unofficially, parole boards would take into account if an offender had initially been sentenced to death, and this would count against them in the parole process. So this at least stopped the likes of serial killers being released. And another thing that happened, whether intentionally or not, is that many of these ex-death row inmates simply fell between the legislative cracks. While Swart served his sentence quietly and without much ado, Plank took every opportunity he could get to get his name out there. In 1996, he married an administrative worker who worked at the police's criminal records centre. Then, in 1997, he teamed up with Janusz Wallace, who was serving a life sentence for murdering Chris Harney, in a bid to take on the prison system for what they saw as discrimination along the lines of sexual orientation. Wallace and Plank complained that they were not afforded the same rights as as heterosexual men that some of their fellow inmates who were engaging in homosexual sex acts were. This claim came not only from the fact that a homosexual man would have access to possible partners in a male prison, but also that they felt that DCS was promoting sex acts between male prisoners because they supplied condoms in prison, which heterosexual men were not able to use because they didn't have access to women. Basically, what Wallace and Plank were asking for is to be granted conjugal visits from their respective partners within the confines of the prison, so that they could enjoy the same rights as their homosexual prison mates. Now, as with many issues raised by offenders with DCS, I can find no updates on whether these two prisoners actually got anywhere with their bid at the time. I do believe that these requests would have been denied, because while our constitution does provide a framework which should allow for conjugal visits for offenders, there is not an expressly stated human right that supports this. And in 2021, when another prisoner was applying for the same right, he too was denied. Although this has absolutely nothing to do with Dean Plank's crime, I do find it very interesting that he continually pushed himself into the limelight, because this would not be the last instance like this. In 2003, after serving 13 years of his sentence, Plank decided that he was not going to be ignored, like so many other lifers who'd been continually overlooked for parole, and he brought a case against the Department of Corrections for failing to consider him for parole. He actually won this case, 
and the judge ruled that DCS had to consider him for parole within the next two years or they would be contravening his rights. Other offenders in similar situations would go on to use Plank's case law for their own appeals against what they considered unfair treatment by DCS in not allowing them to be eligible for parole. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, it's very difficult to actually determine if an offender is still in the system. And I cannot find anything that discusses Plank or Swart's current case. But 33 years after the fact, I'm pretty sure they've both been released. I think for me it was the cold, callous and premeditated manner of this crime that really stood out. Whatever we think about Gert Swart's involvement, he was there throughout and helped make this happen. He stood by as Plank lured a vulnerable man into his vehicle and got him drunk. He sat and covered his face as Plank poured petrol over that man and set him alight. There is perhaps no more sadistic murderer than the one who purposefully targets those who are already vulnerable and in a difficult place in their lives. Johannes Doe was just going about his life, trying his best to keep warm, dry and safe. He was harming no one and just taking a nap on a bench to while away the time until the shelter opened and he could claim a bed for the night. But he crossed paths with the predator before he could do that. Johannes Doe was in his 40s. He was someone's son, a parent who wondered why their child never reappeared. Maybe he was someone's dad, a child who understood that dad was going through a rough time, but held on to the hope that one day he'd walk back in the door and they could try again to build a relationship. Johannes Doe was a human being, who probably just found himself in a really tight spot without housing, maybe struggling with some form of substance use disorder. The fact that he was heading to a shelter tells me that he still valued putting a roof over his head. He still held on to some hope of an improvement in his fortunes one day. He was accessing resources, and maybe he was close to his own breakthrough. But we'll never know, because someone decided that their life was worth more than his. The nameless victims haunt me, because when I hear about them, I cannot help but think about the families I know who still search for their loved ones decades later. Because for every Johannes Doe, there is very likely at least one person out there Hoping, searching, wondering, what happened to that man I knew? Johannes Doe, rest gently. Thank you for listening to episode 81, The Murder of Johannes Doe. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. 